salutations, respective viewers. I'm George from Ireland. Uh, this video is carrying on where I left off yesterday night when I was um, praising Imagine Communities by Benedict Anderson. Uh, so I'm going to give you my reflections on nations, on nationality, identity, um, how accurate it is, um, and then extrapolations from that when it's just played wrong, and dip into a bit of uh, onomastics. So um, one of the uh, observations I made yesterday was to say that uh, so many ancient nations are formed by outsiders, by invaders, uh, by uh, colonial powers. They draw the frontiers and they say this is the nation, put people together who previously didn't regard themselves as being a nation, uh, and yet sometimes come to accept that in decades or uh, over centuries. So look at Britain, Britannia. Well, the ancient Greeks first of all named it. Um, it was um, Strabo, the Greek geographer, but um, Pretanike, the, um, the tin islands, referring to Ireland and Great Britain. Uh, and obviously we had no form of writing in Ireland or Great Britain back then. This is one of my many arguments about the British Isles, about since earliest recorded history, Ireland and Great Britain were regarded as being a unit. Now, of course, we don't have to accept that. Times can change. Um, words evolve. They, uh, they change their meaning and toponyms are no exception. So then the Romans came along and they called it Britannia, this um, um, uh, island. And for them, Britannia only referred to the island of Great Britain and only to part of it. What's now England, Wales and southern Scotland for about 100 years, England, Wales for about 400 years. Of course, there's no concept of Wales, there's no concept of England. Those came later. So we often have to project something back into the past just so people know what we're talking about. Use a name which is anachronistic. Usually anachronistic means that's too old-fashioned, but in this case anachronistic is too modern. I'm saying England in relation to, say, the first century AD when <clears throat> England didn't exist um, as a word, probably as a concept really, until the 8th century AD. A bit like I saw a debate with, um, between, between um, Anne-Marie Waters and Mehdi Hassan. And um, she's talking about, you know, 7th century AD Saudi Arabia. And Mehdi Hassan picks her up on this at a point of pedantry saying, pedantry saying, it didn't exist till 1930, you know, you're only 1,300 years out. So, yes, well done for being so pernickety. But we don't have to say the area that we now call Saudi Arabia, preface it with that. Because, all right, Saudi Arabia as such didn't exist till about 1930. But what else are you going to say for that part of the world if you're looking back to the 7th century AD? I suppose you could just say Arabia, but that's more precise. That could refer to Oman as well. And even the meaning of Arabia stretched might have meant Jordan as well, Syria as well, if you go back far enough. Anyway, back to ancient Britain, Roman Britain. Um, so that waxed and waned, and the Romans were sometimes confused as to whether it included Ireland or not, or was Caledonia, i.e. Scotland, a separate island or not. Notably in Scotland, people sometimes use that word and have Caledonian societies. In Ireland, we seldom say Hibernia. In Wales, sorry, in Wales well, there wasn't a particular word for Wales. Um, there was a Welsh regiment in the 18th century called the Ancient Britons, a regiment of the British Army, on the basis that they really are the Ancient Britons. And in the um, uh, 4th century, well, end of the 4th century AD, Angles, Saxons, the Jutes coming over from what's now Nether the Nether Netherlands, Germany and Denmark, invading Britannia from the east coast. And the Ancient Britons pushed out north to Caledonia, west into what's now Wales, well that was part of Britannia but more of them settling there, into Cumbria. Notice that the Cambrian mountains in Wales, Cambria and Cumbria are almost the same word, they're related down to Cornwall, some of them sailing over to Brittany, some of them coming to Ireland. So in that sense we're the sense, the sense of the ancient Britons in Ireland, people don't like to know this. Pointed out to a nationalist, um, he said, you know, by that rationale the British are German, and I said, uh, yes they are to an extent. The thing is, Germany didn't exist as a polity at the time, didn't exist um, until 1871 as a fully united state. Now, all right, there'd be the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation in the Middle Ages, which wasn't entirely German, and not all of Germany was part of it. So these things are very imprecise, it's very debatable, it's not as straightforward as, as people would like to believe. But um, this uh, chap whom I was uh, discussing it with, my cousin, in fact, he thought that I'd be stumped that I say, no, the British aren't German at all, but I can accept they are, and I'm not Teutonophobic in the least. As I see, I see many close and fraternal links between the two countries, and I think that the British Isles ought to learn a lot more from Germany, which in some places, in some ways, is a splendid way to live. It's a splendid place to live, and the last sort of 
20 years has been phenomenal. So take the pig dee, as the, as the Romans call them, the painted ones, and the people of Caledonia running around naked, painting themselves blue to be scary in battle with, with woad. Um, so that's that. Um, defined from the outside. The Britons defined by the Romans. Many different tribes, almost incessant warfare between them, and the Romans decided they were all together and, and clumped them all together, and eventually that was accepted. So, so the concept of Britannia, that um, fell apart sometime after the Romans left. Then uh, it was discovered, and was it um, uh, King Alfred called himself Rex Totus Britanniae, the king of all Britain, and by that time he was really only ruling um, Wessex, southwest England, um, and uh, London was in Danish hands. Winchester was the capital of, of Wessex. Um, so the, the, the Anglos and Saxons, Anglo-Saxons, they dropped the word Angle, although then they became English and it was England, but often called themselves Saxons rather than Anglo-Saxons. And that's where some various English counties get their names from. Essex is East Saxons, um, Sussex is South Saxons, Middlesex was Middle Saxons, is more or less the London area, because um, until about 1880, strictly speaking, London was only the area around St Paul's Cathedral, about a mile in all directions from St Paul's. Everything else north of the Thames was the county of Middlesex. There was a city of Westminster around Westminster Abbey as well. Middlesex doesn't exist, it's just been absorbed into London. You just have things like Middlesex Hospital, Middlesex University, still keep the name going. There were no North Saxons, there's no Nossex as a county, and Wessex is a collection of several southwestern English counties. So these people, the Angles and Saxons, were descendants of those 5th century AD uh, interlopers, but by the um, 9th century AD, when they're fighting the um, Danes, they, they, they kind of forget that and saying, we're indigenous and you're the baddie invaders, although the Danes are only doing what the Anglo-Saxons had done a few years before. Well, 500 years before. But in historical terms, you might say that's a blinking of an eye. Well, recorded history has been around for about 5,000 years, so it's quite a long time. On the other hand, humans have been around for about 3 million, and we only have recorded history for not even 1% of uh, the time that uh, Homo sapiens have existed as a distinctive species. So, um, yeah, so the idea of Britain, as I say, falls apart. And then it's not really revived again after King Alfred until until um, Dr. John Dee under Queen Elizabeth I. That, what would I say, scryer. Um, the guy thought he could foretell the future, that seer, as the one who sees. But, um, you know, England and Scotland had sometimes been united. The King of Scotland had sometimes been forced to do homage to the King of England. Now, that's another point. Is, is As I said, nations are created by military action very often, as in conquest. The frontier is defended, you lose some territory through the conquest by the other side too. But um, the uh, claim of um, sovereignty cannot be asserted against the right of conquest when your nation's sovereignty rests upon right of conquest. It, that would be um, uh, hypocritical in the extreme and utterly irrational. So look at um, Germany. The, the, the Romans called, them, called it Germania because they're fighting on Germania against the Germani tribe and they just applied it to the whole lot. So defined from the outside, although the ancient Germans called themselves Dietzk, as in just people, but people came, Deutsch evolved from that. And that's why there's a Roman emperor, Germanicus, for his victories over them. There was a Britannicus and Africanus for this. Or even uh, the word Ethiopia is thought to be from the Greek for burnt-faced. Um, so many, uh, many um, countries are named by foreigners, created by foreigners. India, to a large extent, um, created by um, foreigners. Now, I think it's Perry Anderson, it's Benedict Anderson's book, uh, who says that there's this um, Indian nationalist uh, fallacy that India's always been united for 6,000 years. Now, Assam has been united, Assam has broken up and split into several different uh, warring states. Sometimes it included Afghanistan, sometimes it included Nepal, sometimes it included Sri Lanka, sometimes it didn't, and sometimes it had big sort of holes in the middle. Um, so it's waxed and waned a lot. Um, and obviously bits have been part of other empires, not just the British Empire, the Mughal Empire, but obviously only the North, really. Um, or, you know, the Afghans ruled it very briefly, uh, Northern India, that is. Um, and, um, you know, Tibet, is it uh, their suzerainty or not? The Chinese coming in. But let's say the Dutch, the Danes, the French, the Portuguese, all ruling bits of the coast at times. But um, Indonesia, named by the Dutch, created by the Dutch, the Indonesians have little in common themselves spoke scores of different languages, most of them Muslims, a few of them Hindus, used to be a lot more Hindus to the Arabs brought that. So people often, there are often these sword point conversions 
by Christians, by Muslims, by whoever. So Indonesia is really just a um, word for Indian islands. Nisia is a Greek word, ancient Greek word, and the, the Dutch use that a lot because um, Latin and ancient Greek was the mainstay of education in the Western world well into the 20th century. So um, remember, this, even this word India was very vague for Europeans. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, thinking he was going to India, um, because it was widely understood at the time that the world was spherical, by the way. Uh, what else? So that's why he thought those people in the West Indies, the Caribbean, were Indians, and it took uh, a long time before people accepted that they weren't. We were calling them Indians even in the 1980s. Uh, when I was a schoolboy, Native Americans calling them Indians. And so there's the East Indies and the West Indies. But even in the East, India applied to not just what's now India and Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, but we would have said it of, of Malaysia, um, of Singapore, of Indonesia, the Indies. Um, and take Brazil, named by the Portuguese after a mythical Greek king. And, and so it's defined from the outside. And the basis of a full story, this word applies to one of the largest countries in the world. African lands, almost completely created uh, by uh, outsiders, by Europeans, their front is drawn up. Take Chad, um, the president Idris Debi, been there for, my goodness, almost 30 years. He's a Zagawa. Now, his tribe lives astride the Chadian-Sudanese border because that frontier drawn between um, French Equatorial Africa and the Anglo-Egyptian condominium Sudan bisected his people's homeland. And Chad takes his name from a geographical uh, feature, a lake, but I shall go more into onomastics uh, a little bit later. So the study of toponyms is scintillating and revealing in the extreme. So the borders of Europe often drawn by the great powers. Belgium, well, you know the great powers created that one in 1830. Um, and there was little historical basis for it. There'd briefly been a Belgium in the 1790s. There was some ancient Roman province for a while with a similar name, but that was that. They mostly spoke Flemish at the time. There were, um, I suppose, mostly Catholics, the Dutch were mostly Protestants, that was about it. But there were some were, were Wallons speaking French, but often speaking their dialect, Wallonois, rather than actual French. Later on, moving to standard French, and then the French language was heavily promoted um, Flemish had no official status to the late 19th century. Um, anyway, so we see that there were prestige languages, like French became the prestige language in Belgium. Shouldn't you join France then? No, they didn't want to do that. But the British were very keen to have it there as a buffer state. They didn't want the other two major maritime powers, France or the Netherlands, to be too mighty. So borders of Europe, I mean, I could talk about Poland or the Czech Republic or, or Slovakia and on and on and on, often drawn by the great powers and the people themselves there didn't get to decide, just had to accept it. But I could look on to, um, you know, the United States, obviously there's an English creation on the, on the East Coast, um, we all know about the revolution, and then the Louisiana Purchase. Not a single person in, in Louisiana was consulted, and it's far, far bigger than the modern state of Louisiana. Louisiana used to refer to an area something like 20 times larger than the modern state of Louisiana. So these frontiers, these political units are often very, very new, yet they engender very deep emotional attachment, except sometimes they don't, and people don't care about it and say it's false. People telling me that the United Kingdom doesn't really exist, it's a nonsense, it's not a nation, it's one state, four nations, or is it the other way around? Um, and then, you know, the United Kingdom could very easily have an ex, Jersey, Guernsey, Sark, the Channel Isles, we use that expression, the Channel Isles, but it's a geographical one, not a political one. Those three islands, they've all got separate governments. So they rely on the United Kingdom for defense and foreign affairs, but they're internally self-governing. The, the, the French call them les îles anglo-normandes, and they're ruled by the Duchess of Normandy, as in Elizabeth II, the last part of the Duchy of Normandy to um, still be ruled by that family. Um, the Isle of Man, again, the United Kingdom could have uh, absorbed that, but hasn't done so. So it has this um, anomalous status. And their various crown dependencies say Montserrat, which are like that. Should we call them colonies? It doesn't have to be a bad word. And there are um, other, other countries in limbo in the Pacific, which are connected to the United States, like Guam or Nauru and so on. So um, many countries and provinces around the world are named after other ones. Look at some states of the US, New Mexico, New Hampshire, New York, New Jersey. Uh, I could go on. And obviously many cities there are named after European countries. As I say, it would really discombobulate to know to the English to know that England's actually named after a bit of Germany. British Columbia, named after a nationality. 
and um, Christopher Columbus, Cristobal Colon, let's give him his real name, a mysterious figure. Was he Catalan? Was he Italian? Well, the Italians have got a huge statue of him up in Genoa Harbour, and um, he's got two graves, a man who's mysterious in death as in life, one in the Dominican Republic, the other one in Granada Cathedral. I've seen it. So look at the Australian states, named after different places, New South Wales, named after someone in the United Kingdom, Victoria, named after a monarch, and so on. Um, so I noticed the way there was Western Australia and South Australia. Why not call it Southern Australia, have the suffix E-R-N? Or maybe just cut, cut the E-R-N off Western Australia, call it West Australia. It's a curious anomaly. And one place called Tasmania, after the um, uh, Dutch seafarer Abel Tasman. It used to be called Van Diemen's Land. I don't know why they changed it from one Dutchman's name to another. Uh, and there we go. So Australia named after a point of the compass, Terra Australis Incognita, Southern Unknown Land. And the, when the French created some of their um, African provinces, they were stuck for names. They called one of them Mauritania. Looking back into the annals, they found that the Romans had called one of their North African provinces Mauritania. So the French called this place Mauritania. The trouble is, modern Mauritania and ancient Mauritania don't overlap, not by one centimeter. They're on the same continent, but they're not the same place. Or well, Libya was an Italian invention. They look back into the annals. What did the Romans used to call this place? Libya. Okay, we'll call it that. They only called it that in, in about 1930. They cobbled together three Ottoman provinces, Tripolitania, Cyrenaica, and the Fezzan. Oh, isn't colonialism terrible? We hate its legacy, but we're still going to keep the borders. That is one of the curious anomalies of African nationalism. So um, uh, look at Albania. Well, which one? There are two of them. There's the Republic of Albania, Shkip Garishka. The, um, the, the land of the eagle, isn't it, it's, it's fascinating the way the, the eagle is such a popular emblem, and the double-headed eagle as well in Germany, in Russia, well, American bald eagle, and blah, blah, blah. So a majestic thing, the king of all birds. I shan't tell you the Irish rhyme about that one. But Azerbaijan was called Albania a very long time ago as well, when it was a Christian country. Or another thing which um, is intriguing is the way the national poet of Azerbaijan, Nizabi Ganjavi, wrote entirely in Persian. So the Iranians claim him too. And there was this sort of Persian identity through Iran, through Azerbaijan at one time, into Tajikistan, into half of Afghanistan. But um, Persian was sometimes spoken in Pakistan and deep into India, into the early 19th century. Only then did the language of the courts shift to English. So, um, so Ukraine, its name is at the edge. So this is onomastics, the study of the uh, origins of place names. New Zealand, named after a place in the Netherlands, the province of Zealand. Um, or take the Amazon rainforest, is named after a Greek myth. The Portuguese explorers saying, remember that story about these women warriors with their bows and arrows? We'll call them Amazons. Uh, and so it stuck. Or, you know, so I talked about Christopher Columbus, but there's the country of Colombia, or well, there's Columbia University, and on and on. Take Bolivia, named after Simon um, de Bolivar who was not from there, he was from Venezuela. So a, co a country named after a person who was not from that country and only briefly set foot in that land. See, Kazakhstan meaning free country, just like, just like um, Thailand means free country. And um, I'm not sure that Kazakhstan is noticed, noted for its uh, level of civil liberty. If we go back to the 1920s and the Soviets, well, they created the Soviet Union in 1922, and they really tried to just rebuild the Russian Empire under a new guise. And the Kazakhs were several hordes, the Great Horde, the Middle Horde, the Little Horde, and the Golden Horde. And the Russians simply decided these people were all the same and put them together. Now, it's true that in the 15th century, Kazakhstan had briefly existed. Um, but these people were largely nomadic. They're following their herds of horses, or in some cases, camels. So these um, pastoralists had to be itinerant in, the, in search of fresh pasture and more water. They had some sort of sense of territory because they go in a circuit between different um, meadows and different wells. But anyway, in the 1920s, Kyrgyzstan was way bigger than Kazakhstan. Then the Moscow changed its mind and actually gave most of that territory to Kazakhstan. So they changed around in terms of size. Um, so there we are. And, and they, the, the Russians simply picked one of the dialects of Kazakh to be the official version. So often there was little concept of nationality there or in the Caucasus, people often just saying they're Muslims and the Russian chroniclers simply calling these people Saracens or whatever or Muslims and getting very confused between who's um, Dagestani, who's, who's an English, who's Lesgian and so forth. 
Um, so look at Turkey and Turkmenistan. Turkey, in a sense, is named after Turkmenistan, where the Turks started out. And a thousand years ago, the Turks exploded, moving in all directions, north, south, east, west, which were got Tatars in the Volga Valley, Uyghurs in western China, and the um, Turks moving west, defeating the um, Byzantines at the Battle of Manzikert, moving into Anatolia, and gradually taking over what's now Turkey. Um, in uh, 1453, is it, capturing Constantinople, which they renamed Istanbul. And the, the Turks got all the way to the gates of Vienna around about 1690. So that was a very long way from Turkmenistan. But the Turks, are they ethnically Turkish? Is there a Turkish ethnicity? Look at the phenotype, everything from very white to very brown and all shades in between. So it's not clear what a Turkish person is supposed to look like. They don't really have an ethnic core. And of course, they form the Ottoman Empire, stretching all the way to Morocco, at least nominally, Egypt, in a sense, all the way to Uganda. Because um, Egypt, right up until 1914, was theoretically part of the Ottoman Empire. They ruled much of what's now Saudi Arabia, the Ottomans. But anyway, um, the Ottomans used to raid Europe for, for slaves, raiding Russia, raiding the coast of Italy, Spain, France, wherever else they conquered Hungary. And that's why the Spanish say, no hay moriscos in la costa. There are no moors on the coast. We would say the coast is clear. Um, so that's why a lot of European blood got into their gene pool on obviously enslaving people in Africa too. So they're very much, um, how to put it, multi-ethnic people. Misignation, I embrace it, very literally. Um, so look at uh, Russia, the Tsar is bizarre of all the Russias, of Rus, the ancient word for Russia, a bit like saying Britannia in English in relation to Britain. But um, of, of white Russia, Belarus, of black Russia, that's Ukraine, or sometimes calling it little Russia. So calling it after a color, well, Ukraine, black Russia for the black soil, Belarus, I'm not sure why it's white. And look at Switzerland. In 1291, some men gathered in Rutli, that meadow, as in little clearing in the local Swiss dialect, and swore they'd never allow themselves to be oppressed. They're going to rebel against the Duke of Austria. And so they set up the first canton of Schwitz. And that canton, with a tiny population, gave its name to the country, as gradually more and more cantons, more and more valleys joined and formed Switzerland. Or Alger Algeria takes its name from Algiers, the island. Only a tiny, tiny bit of the country is an island. When you deepen the Sahara, it doesn't seem like an island. Um, there are very few countries where the, where the country takes the name from the capital city, or let's say Luxembourg, Singapore, I can't think of the other one. The capital city and the name of the country are the same. Yeah, we did not say Luxembourg City, maybe just Luxembourg, or Mexico City in Mexico. Um, so, you think that the Nigeria, the most populous country in Africa, obviously is a completely invented country, all countries are invented, but some of them come into being very suddenly and are created completely by outsiders. Hundreds of different languages, often at daggers drawn with each other, and Lady Lugard invented the name, because the river Niger. Um, but Niger, or sorry, in, in, in Latin, well, I shan't say it, but it rhymes with trigger, um, is, is the word for black, the color black. The trouble is, in Latin, it also means evil. You can even see a quotation from uh, Edmund Burke, where he cites the Latin tag, saying that man is N-word, meaning evil, not meaning a black person, but has come to be a racist uh, epithet. Um, and then the French have got Niger, just north of Nigeria, again, where the river Niger flows through. Um, same idea. Um, so, <clears throat> look at Pakistan, founded on a faith, land of the pure, Punjabis, Afghans. Afghans, even though they didn't actually include Afghanistan, but the northwest frontier, frontier province, or the Khyber Pukhtunkhwala, as was, uh, was um, more or less Afghan. The same people, Patans on either side of the Durand line. Kashmiris and Sindhis. That's how they came up with this acronym, Pak Pakistan meaning land of the pure in Persian didn't have a B for Bangladesh or Bengal, despite the fact that the majority of the population was in East Pakistan or Bangladesh as it now is. So Islam wasn't enough to keep it united with Bangladesh, a bit like Israel founded on a religion. So uh, a bit like Northern Ireland in a sense, their Protestant homeland, but took a lot of Catholics in too. So Guinea, that's a fascinating one. I thought, does it relate to the coin? I mean, or does it mean meaning one pound and one shilling? That's a unit of, of, of money, a guinea. And either there's still horse races in England called the Thousand Guineas and so on. We don't use that anymore since shillings were abolished in 1973. So there's Papua New Guinea, there's Equatorial Guinea, there's Guinea and there's Guinea-Bissau. 
Three of those are in Africa. So Equatorial Guinea is actually not on the equator. It's close. And Ecuador takes its name from the equator. When in Spanish, its name simply means equator. Um, anyway, there's the country Benin, and there's also Benin City, which is not in Benin. It's in Nigeria. So it gets terribly confusing. Uh, names. What's in a name? Derry, London Derry in Ireland. Should we call it Stroke City? Or should we call it the Maiden City since it was never entered? The besiegers didn't break through in 1689. Or should we call that county by its old name, County Coleraine? So I often hear people tell me that Ireland's not, sorry, the UK's not a real nation. It's four nations, or perhaps three and a quarter, because of the status of Northern Ireland. And look at Northern Ireland. The people there, are they Irish or Northern Irish? Are they Ulster or what? Are they British? Now, you can have two or more of these identities. Now, I knew a unionist lady, quite moderate, said, well, people call me Irish. I prefer Northern Irish, actually, because they think Irish means from the Republic of Ireland. She's very broad-minded. She'd swum for the Republic of Ireland. She wore a, a Irish Republic football jersey, but her father said, I'll only buy it for you on condition you only wear it in the house, because you get, get a lot of grief from our neighbours if you wear it outside. So, Ulster. Can you say that you're Ulster? It's not an adjective, it's a noun. Well, because there's no such word as Ulster-ish. But the same as New Zealand. that You can't you say New Zealand-ish. So the noun and the, and the adjective can be the same. So, the United Kingdom. The indigenous peoples would be the English, the Welsh, the Scots, the Cornish. But are they even indigenous? As I point out, the English are to some extent Anglo-Saxons. And where do the ethnic minorities fit in? We've arrived in very significant numbers since the Windrush generation. Since that ship, SS Empire Windrush docked in 1948. But of course, there have been Indians and Chinese people since the early 17th century, just very, very few of them. Almost all men intermarried and they gradually blurred into the white population. Uh, there have been black people, there are certainly black people in the Middle Ages, very, very few, um, and possibly in ancient Roman times. How black is black? People from those North African provinces of, 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 of Rome, were they black or not? Does that count as black? Some of them were in very pale-skinned Berbers, I don't know. So some of the white nationalists tell me, oh, that's a BBC myth. They weren't really black people. They were just Greek communities or Phoenician communities from North Africa. I remember Ian Smith, the former leader of Zimbabwe, as in was called Rhodesia back then, him claiming Organization of African Unity, or the African Union as it is now. It shouldn't include these North African countries. Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Egypt, they're not really African. They shouldn't be part of it. It's by just some geographical quirk. We count them as being part of Africa, the part of the Middle East. But these zones of the world, they overlap Africa and the Middle East. So it's true that the United Kingdom is a bit of a smorgasbord and it has many um, very uh, lively local identities within it, but that's true of most, most nations. To look at France alone, who's totally French? I'm not sure. But look at the indigenous identities of the Basques, the Catalans, the Bretons, the Alsatians, and the extreme north, a few people speaking Flemish, and... Um, uh, you know, there's Occitan, a language in the south with dialects like Canwa, Niswa, and so forth. Nice used to be part of part of Italy. Indeed, Garibaldi, the founder of Italy, was born there. And I don't know, the Corsican identity. So I won't go through all the countries, but it could be true of almost any European country. Look at the Sorb people in Germany, an indigenous Slavonic people there, Slavonic speaking. All right, so nations can exist on two or more levels. I read the Spanish Constitution in 2003, and I was bowled over to read about the nations within Spain, mentioned the Catalans and the Galicians and the Valencians and so forth. The Galicians almost like a melange of um, Castilian and Portuguese, those two languages. So India's got hundreds of languages within it. Should we say hundreds of nations? It's debatable. It's got lots of states, keeps creating more each time. In the 1950s, many people were going on hunger strike to create a new state based around their language group. So uh, the Congress party in India was kind of hoisted on its own petard, had been trying these tactics against the British Raj, and then it came back to them, being told that they were so brutal. Uh, so nations can be a melting pot. It was particularly said of the United States. You take your national identity and customs, and we blend those, and we see what we come out with, and that's, uh, let's say, American identity. Even a white supremacist like um, uh, Tucker Carlson will say he, eat ta he eats tacos, but simply can't accept they come from Mexico, a country for which he appears to harbour nothing but contempt. So um, look at the uh, Spanish-speaking polities in Latin America. But they have indigenous nations within them and indigenous languages, which have made a bit of a comeback. So although they all share a language and all share, share the same historical experience, there's uh, very strong national identities. And all, there was a sort of unhealthy rivalry between, say, Chile and Argentina. And Che Guevara, not my favourite person, 
talked about uniting them. They could at least form a confederation. But they've got Mercosur, as in Market of the South. So language is certainly not enough to, to, to unite you. The one thing about the English language is really, in a sense, it's just a blend between French and German. And obviously we can trace the French back to Latin and trace some of that back to Greek and some of that back to goodness knows where. Phoenician, possibly. Where did language start? Well, the Turks will tell you in ancient times, a Turk gazed at the sun and expressed his awe by making a noise through his throat. And so language was invented. Well, I, I have no idea. I wonder if we could crack animal languages sometimes, like chimpanzee noises. Do these actually have a linguistic signification? Just possibly. Now, it may be hard to believe, but I'm not a chimp. But even I could deduce their meaning. Sometimes they can express emotions to you. So that's the thing about um, English is um, heavily borrowed from other languages. And I could look at almost any English sentence and then just break that down and look several of these words. Well, that's a Latin one. That's a German one, blah, blah, blah. I remember when I went to Norway and I saw a sign saying Bjern, child. I thought, that's Scottish. I know, is there a Scots dialect? Is that a language or a dialect or what? It seemed plain silly to me to claim it was that. All they do is take the standard English word and change one vowel in most words. But there's some of them even I don't know, despite having spent six years in Scotland. And what is a language is a sort of a political thing, is it's a controversial issue, it's a political football, so that's why some people try to use this value-neutral term, code, to avoid having to say either language or dialect. It's difficult to classify something as a language or dialect. How different does it have to be? Is it just bad English? Or no, does it have its own grammatical rules? The same with Ebonics in the United States. So you no, know, it is grammatically consistent, it just doesn't start to follow canonical grammar. So, as I say, the all nations are invented to, to some extent. They have to begin some time. And Newt Gingrich, he said contemptuously that the Palestinians were an invented people. Now, coming from an American, that might seem rich because few nations are as invented as his one is, which is not to say it's not real and obviously commands a very strong emot emotional loyalty amongst his people. So, people talk about national interests as though something would be to the advantage of all of us, of all social classes, of all points of view, which is clearly not the case. And a Marx is like... Um, Anderson would have said, we need to care about class interests. What is going to further the interests of the proletariat, the peasantry? How do we benefit these people who are living in such dire penury? So when people are living in abject poverty, we need to alleviate their suffering and not be caring about chauvinism, about flag waving. John Hume is an Irish nationalist, perhaps ironically, a socialist. John Hume famously said, you cannot eat a flag. We've got to care about bread and butter issues and not about which flag flies over this land. So the fascinating thing to observe is the way that national identity is far more puissant than class. Look at the emotional purchase it has on people. It can really tug at people's heartstrings. I saw that film Riley Ace of Spies years ago, starring Sam Neill, a New Zealander from Northern Ireland. But anyway, it's based on a real character, a mysterious character. Was he British? Was he really Russian Jewish or whatever? But he was a spy on behalf of the UK in Russia, in the First World War and in the Russian Civil War. Um, but anyway, Riley is speaking to someone, a socialist, right before the First World War, and the socialist says, the working class of Europe will not fight. One proletarian will not slaughter his brother, okay? Class, loyalty, class identity, that's what matters. That will trump national identity. Well, he couldn't have been more wrong. Socialists, with a few honourable exceptions, happily slaughtered their fellow socialists in the name of national identity. So, national identity, it can be intellectually jejun, it requires overlooking a lot of uh, inconvenient facts, it requires some myth-making, some selective exaggeration, but in other respects it's not meagre because of the fabulous artistic and musical traditions it can draw on, and despite being so rational, despite striving to analyse all this as objectively as I can, I can't help but feel um, my heart pounding, the adrenaline, co adrenaline coursing to my muscles when I hear certain melodies. The devil has all the best tunes, images and so on. Uh, so I suppose that's it because we're much more um, emotional than rational beings. So nations are imagined communities um, to some extent. You could say, well, almost all communities are imagined. I don't like everybody of my nationality, whichever that is. I don't dislike everybody of other nationalities. I don't even have that in common, that much in common with people of my nationality. Um, so for me, personality type matters a lot more. If you've got a, per a compatible personality type, 
And that's the thing about fighting for a country. You have to, uh, you have to fight for the absolute rats of your nationality as well as the good ones. And you have to kill a lot of the fabulous people whom you get along with like a house on fire of the other nationality, not just the bad ones. So there we are. I sometimes wonder, would we be better, better, better off without nationality?